Hi, my name is Fran Mayer and welcome to another Napa uh, Institute podcast. Uh, our guest today is someone I've been following for at least 20 years. Rod Dreher is a husband and father and a writer and critic focused in a special way on issues of religion, politics, and culture. He's a prodigious public speaker with bylined articles too numerous to recount and the author of books ranging from Crunchy Cons to The Little Way of Ruthie Lemming and How Dante Can Save Your Life to his enormously popular work, The Benedict Option, released in 2017. In September of this year, Sentinel, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House, published Live Not by Lies, a manual for Christian dissidents. Rod's latest book, um, and it's a pleasure to welcome him today to talk about it. Rod, um, you have the unhappy and ambiguous gift of being a canary in the cultural coal mine. You've, you've seen trends developing in the country over the last 20 years that uh, you were at least two or three years ahead of the curve in terms of understanding them and writing about them very forcefully. You published The Benedict Option in 2017 and your new book, Live Not By Lies, uh, has appeared less than four years later, which is a pretty quick turnaround. Why the two books and when and why did you decide to write Live Not By Lies? Well, the two books, Fran, are, uh, some people say it's the first two books in a trilogy, and I don't know what the third part's going to be, but they definitely have the Not same. Sure I want to know what the third part is. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but they, they definitely are, are on the same theme of cultural decline and what it means to be a faithful Christian in a time of cultural decline. Believe it or not, the, the, uh, the, the idea for Live Not By Lies came even before I started working on the Benedict Option. Mm -hmm. I got a phone call in 2015, the spring of 2015, from uh, a Catholic physician uh, up in, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He got my number from a mutual friend, and he said, listen, I have to tell somebody this. My mother uh, lives with me, my elderly mother, and she spent uh, four years in prison in her native Czechoslovakia as a young woman because she uh, was a Catholic who was opposed to the regime. And uh, today she's telling me, son, the things I'm seeing happen in America now remind me of the things that were happening in my country when I was growing up. Well, I thought that was kind of alarmist, um, believe me. And, and if Rod Dreher finds it alarmist, it must be alarmist. But so I, I made a point of asking people I knew personally and people I would meet over the next few years in my travels, people who had grown up in Russia or in the Soviet bloc, hey, are, are you seeing things that remind you of what you left behind? Every one of them, Fran, said, yeah, absolutely. And if you talk to them about it, you would find out that most of them are kind of angry that Americans didn't, didn't get it. So... Um, I wrote Live Not By Lies. I came up with the idea for it in 20, early 2019, mm -hmm. seeing how things, a lot of the same trends I talked about in the Benedict Option were really accelerating uh, under the, the past, under, under this administration as the left has become more radicalized. And uh, I, turn, I finally convinced my publisher, my editor at, at Penguin Random House at Sentinel, that imprint there, that I actually had an idea, but it was kind of hard to sell her on it. And in fact, this year, 2020, I finished the final manuscript in March. When I turned it in, I thought, gosh, how am I going to sell this to my readers? How am I going to convince Americans that we really are rushing into uh, what I call soft totalitarianism? Well, I'll tell you, Fran, after the events of the last six months, I don't have to, to struggle at all to sell people on this. A lot of people have been red-pilled by these events and know that something really bad is coming. Yeah. You, you know, uh, you know, as well as I do, Rod, that there were a number of critics of the Benedict Option that suggested that, well, it's well written, but uh, it's alarmist. Basically, Rod is calling for people to withdraw to the hills or start uh, Christian enclaves and withdraw from society. And if you read the book, actually, it doesn't. That's not the point at all. Um, how do you deal with those critics? And, and what, in your own words, are the key messages of the Benedict Option? You know, it, it's so frustrating that even three years after the Benedict Option was published, I still get people saying, well, you're talking about heading for the hills, aren't you? It's not it at all. I, fortunately, this year, uh, with the release of that fantastic film by Terrence Malick, A Hidden Life, 
I have a movie I can point to and say, this film based on the real life of the blessed Franz Jägerstädter tells why we need the Benedict option. In that movie, uh, Franz Jägerstädter lived in an Austrian village. You know, you could not get farther away from the, the big city than this Austrian village, a Catholic village, but Nazism found its way there. But Franz was and his family were the only ones who could resist because of the life they had been living before the Nazis came, a life of piety, of studying the gospels, of being faithful Catholics. Other churchgoers fell to the, to the wiles of Nazism, but not the Jägerstaters. So when I tell people who've seen that film, I say, this is why we need the Benedict option. Even though they lived far away from the world, they were still in the world in the sense that Nazism affected them. But because of the way they lived in peacetime, they were able to not only spot the Antichrist when he showed her and Antichrist when he showed up, but Franz was able to resist even unto death. So that's when I talk about what is the Benedict option, it's living like Franz Jägerstädter did. Now, the key messages of the Benedict option are that, first of all, we live in a post-Christian world, not in a world that where there are no Christians. Clearly, we're all here, but it's a world that no longer understands itself by the Christian story. The, the story that we, we live by is not the story of the Bible. Secondly, the world is not only post-Christian, but uh, it, it's increasingly a world in which the Christian claims make no sense to people. Uh, we have come to live by what Charles Taylor, the philosopher Charles Taylor, calls mm -hmm. an anthropology of expressive individualism. That is to say, you know, we, we believe that mankind is whatever he chooses to be. And uh, there is no such thing as objective truth. There is only uh, opinions about truth. I'm being very general, but that's that's generally the culture we're living in now. And that's why Alistair McIntyre, the philosopher, says that emotivism is the chief uh, form, right. chief thing that governs our, our discourse. In other words, you don't say this is true. You say, I feel this is true. And there, there's no way to, to solve disputes because there's no common shared uh, play, uh, base from which to reason. Third, I say that this uh, approximates the fall of the Western Roman Empire, and I point to St. Benedict of Nursia, who emerged out of the ruins of, of the fall of Rome, to create a way of living out the gospel in tight communities in a way that both preserved the gospel and preserved this knowledge through the Dark Ages, but also was a blessing to everybody else. Those monks, the Benedictine monks, as they moved throughout Europe in the Dark Ages, they helped people, they evangelized people, they taught them how to grow crops and all, so on and so forth. They were what Benedict XVI called a creative minority. Mm -hmm. I think that we lay Christians in the 21st century in the ruins of our civilization need to figure out uh, how we can appropriate the Benedictine example and Benedictine teachings in order to build the same kind of resilient communities today. So if you take those messages Rod, um, how does live, by lie, live Not By Lies build on them? What are the key messages of Live Not By Lies? Well, Live Not By Lies is more focused and less abstract than the Benedict Option. I think that might be why it's, got, it's selling better. The Benedict Option sold well, but Live Not By Lies has really, uh, really been a hit, an early hit. In Live Not By Lies, I talk about the same kinds of things that are in the Benedict Option, that we are living in a world that is increasingly hostile to Christianity. But uh, rather than talk about the philosophical and theological uh, challenges facing Christians in the way we live, I talk more specifically about where the attacks are coming from, specifically this ideology of wokeness, how uh, it targets Christians, how intolerant it is of Christians and what we can do in practical terms to prepare ourselves spiritually for what is to come. Yeah, you know, you take the, um, you take the title for your book from a 1974 essay by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who of course is one of the great writers of the last century. But a lot of people may, may argue that, well, Solzhenitsyn was a very important Christian witness uh, in a really murderous regime, but hey, they lost, we won, we're the good guys. America in 2020 is so very different from the Soviet Union in 1974. How do you respond to that? Well, I would say we have to listen to Solzhenitsyn for the same reason that we have to listen to our fellow Americans, immigrants from communist countries, who are telling us that something like what they left behind is now emerging. It's a very different kind of totalitarianism than what Solzhenitsyn had to face. 
but this is a softer one, one that is taking us over very slowly, yet deliberately, using the means of liberal democracy and the language of liberal democracy and uh, free market capitalism. What makes it totalitarian though, is that it's a to totalizing ideology, uh, an ideology of command that demands that we not only obey it in our acts, but that we also agree with it, that we change our thought to accept it. Um, and it's built on lies. It's built on lies about human nature. It's built on lies about reality and lies about how power is used. And it, in fact, it's a rival religion, Fran, to be honest. It is, I have found it so much easier to understand wokeness and the social justice warriors by thinking of them as a rival religion to Christianity instead of a political movement. And what clicked that for me was studying the Russian Revolution, reading this wonderful book by a Russian American historian, Yuri Sleskin, called The House of Government, The History of the Russian Revolution. And he said that the way to understand the Bolsheviks is that they were a, an apocalyptic, millenarian, political cult. Mm -hmm. They weren't religious people, but they went about politics as if it were a form of religion. And once you've read that about the Bolsheviks, you understand our social justice warriors as having the same sort of fanatical, zealous motivation. A lot makes sense. Yeah, Vogelin said much the same thing in terms of analyzing things like progressive, he didn't have the expression wokeism, obviously at the time, but progressivism and all the politics of the left that uh, kind of uh, fused into Marxist Leninist thought um, were really essentially corrupted religious thinking uh, about God. You know, and, you know, what's interesting, Fran, about the social justice warriors compared to the, the Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks at least believed in a particular kind of utopia that one day the state would wither away and we would all live in perfect harmony once exploitation was done away with. What I can't figure out is what our own social justice warriors are aiming at. It, it seems that they are about nonstop criticism, just unmasking more and more structures of power, but where does it end? I, I don't know that it can end. It's gonna be nothing but, but endless violence until something stops it. See, I think that the reaction to that that you'll get from them, Rod, is that we're not obligated to think about what comes next. We're obligated to tear down the corrupt structures that are now, right. and then naturally new things will emerge that are, are better somehow. I mean, they don't need a metaphysics because they're not about that. Right, and you know, to go back to your previous question about uh, live not by lies and Benedict option, uh, the man I dedicate this book to is a man named Father Tomislav Kolakovic. Mm -hmm incredible Catholic priest, born in Zagreb in, in Croatia, uh, escaped the Gestapo to go hide out in Slovakia in 1943. When he got there, he was teaching in the Catholic University. He gathered around him a bunch of Catholic students and said, look, the good news is the Germans are going to lose this war. The bad news is the Soviets are going to take over and they're going to come after the church. So what Kolakovich did was build these tight communities of faithful young Catholics who not only studied the teachings of the church and how it applied to the situation they were in, but they also studied uh, the means of resistance, like how to resist an interrogation. They spread these, these groups throughout Slovakia. Uh, some of the bishops told him, you're being an alarmist, don't do this. But he didn't listen because he knew the mind of the Soviets. Sure enough, when the Iron Curtain fell, uh, the first thing the communists did, they came after the churches and the priests. But Kolakovich's network of faithful believers became the backbone of the underground church. Now, you might, uh, another title for Live Not By Lives could have been the Kolakovich option mm -hmm. because he's talking, <laughs> seriously. He, yeah, no, I know, you're dead on. Yeah, because uh, the Benedict option, it's much broader and more cultural. But in the Kolakovich option, this is guerrilla warfare and, and how the church and Christians sustain themselves under this intense attack right now. Yeah, see, I think one of the most powerful things about uh, this second volume, Rod, is that, uh, that some of the themes, as you indicate, are similar, but you really hook them to individuals who have the experience of it, and their witness can't be argued with. It's not some sort of abstract discussion about the bad things in totalitarianism. These are people who know it or who know their parents who knew it directly that really make a it makes a very powerful reading. The other thing I like about the book, frankly, is that you have these two parts to it, the first being essentially analytical and the second part 
uh, prescriptive in the sense that you're telling people, you actually give people certain things to do. And we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but, but I want to, I don't want to lose Solzhenitsyn because yeah. uh, in 1974, Solzhenitsyn was everybody's hero. He was a great writer uh, in the West. He was lionized as being against the Soviet uh, dictatorship. Uh, and then he made the mistake of giving his famous talk at in 1978 to Harvard. Uh, and the uh, admiration of the liberal-minded uh, leadership classes in this country, uh, you could hear the air going out of their, <laughs> their uh, air going out of their respect for him. I mean, what did he say about the West that was so, dis so um, disturbing to the people who heard it? They expected him to come to Harvard four years after his expulsion from the Soviet Union and to give uh, three cheers for the West, but he didn't do that. He went there and chastised them. He told them, you know, I, I'm a big, I'm a, an implacable foe of the Soviet system, but I could not recommend the West as a replacement system for my country. And he criticized, especially the elites for lacking courage. He said that they, they, they didn't believe in anything, that uh, they lacked virtue, uh, they were decadent, they were arrogant. And they, uh, you know, again, that they were no model for, this, for the Soviets to follow. And uh, I think that everything Solzhenitsyn said in 1978, which made him so unpopular at Harvard and with American elites, could be applied tenfold today, yeah. especially when you see how the elite classes in our country, uh, the leadership of important institutions like, like universities, newspapers, and institutions of civil society, have collapsed in the face of this woke assault. I mean, it, it's incredibly discouraging because this is exactly what happened in late imperial Russia. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the middle classes and the leaders of these institutions quit believing in what the czar stood for, but uh, and they just surrendered when they were attacked by the Bolsheviks, by their own children, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, we're a very long way from the gulag. We're a long way from the Holocaust. Uh, People are going to say, well, this is a really interesting book, uh, but hey, it can't happen here for all sorts of reasons. Um, what's your answer to that? I would remind them what Solzhenitsyn said, that the worst mistake you can make is to assume that what happened in Russia could not happen in your country. It can happen anywhere in the world. Hannah Arendt, in her great book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, warned the same thing, as did Václav Havel. Uh, I would say that we have to constantly be aware that totalitarianism could happen here. And I wouldn't permit myself to go as far as some of my you know, former communist subjects would and say that hard totalitarianism is coming here. Some of them really believe that. They think I'm an optimist, but I don't think, <laughs> seriously, I don't think it's gonna to come to that, friend, because I don't think they'll have to do that. I think they'll be able to use softer means to control us and gain conformity. I think they'll use something like a, the Chinese social credit system. Yeah. For, for your listeners who don't know what that is, very briefly, it's a system that's run in China. Everybody in China, every citizen, has a social credit profile that the government keeps uh, in their computers, and they gather constantly the data from each citizen's smartphone use, their computer use, uh, what is their, the, the cameras armed with artificial intelligence, facial recognition software picks up on the street, and it assigns a constantly changing social credit rating. If you get a higher rating, that means you're a good citizen who can be trusted and you get all kinds of privileges. If you get a lower rating for doing things like hanging out with dissidents or going to church, you'll get a lower rating and that makes it harder to access the economy and certain privileges. Already in the US, our uh, major corporations collect all this data completely exactly. legally. You know, it's not a secret, they do this. And it's not gonna take much for them to weaponize it against deplorables and dissenters and people who are against social justice in, in the eyes of this new ideology. I think this is the thing we have to watch out for. And we can't see it coming because our idea of what totalitarianism is, is based on the Soviet Union and it's based on George Orwell's 1984. Mm -hmm. I think rather we need to watch out for an Aldous Huxley Brave New World type system, one that doesn't manipulate us by inflicting pain and terror, but rather by managing our comfort and our access to sources of status and easy living. You know, I think, uh... I've said this actually in another interview I did that uh, 
China is the world's largest surveillance state. But in another sense, that's not really true. I mean, we're living in the largest surveillance state in the in the country in, in on the planet, except that it's not weaponized in the same way. I mean, the the amount of information that's collected from people, as you indicate, um, as I'm sitting here with my phone on my desk, you know, and and all sorts of yeah. artificial intelligence, uh, you know, gadgets all over the household. I mean, they're all they're all very capable of listening nonstop all day long to our conversations and tracking what we do. And they do. They don't. They, it's, the government just doesn't use it in the way that the Chinese do. I think most people don't understand how sophisticated technology has become in 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 tracking us. And so your point, I think, is 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 really very well taken. Um, we have a constitution. We have two hundred years of democracy. Uh, to what degree can those things, we're a nation of laws. I mean, we're actually a confected nation in the sense that uh, we wouldn't exist if we hadn't been constructed by, uh, from abstract principles. Um, but those principles are very strong. And uh, why wouldn't they hold up against what's going on right now? Why, why can't I at 72 say, hey, I went through this in the 60s. I'm familiar with it. We went through it in the 30s. You know, people grow up, they have families, blah, blah, blah. I mean, what, what is so unique about the current moment that changes that ability to simply dismiss what's happening? Well, it's a complicated story, but I think a lot of it has to do with the lack of historical memory and cultural memory. Yeah. This is one of the key things that uh, totalitarian governments use to control populations. They gain control of a, pe a people's sense of itself and who it is and who it has been. That's why fights over things like statues of historical figures are so important. They're symbolically important. And what they symbolize is how a, nat a nation remembers itself. Uh, one thing I learned in doing this work is that when the Nazis invaded Poland, uh, it was really difficult to take up any kind of arms against the Wehrmacht, but the Nazis set out to uh, conquer the Polish people by destroying their memory of themselves as a distinct nation and destroying their Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. So young Carol Wojtyla, the future John Paul II, and his friends who were part of the theatrical circle, they knew that keeping memory of what it meant to be Polish alive was the best thing they could do to fight to Nazi totalitarianism. So they wrote plays about Polish patriotic themes and also Catholic themes and perform them underground for audiences who are risking their lives just to show up. This is the kind of thing that, that we desperately need here in, in this country, uh, because today we are so historically ignorant. We don't teach history. We don't care about history. Uh, so many of us see history as a burden on our free choice. Right. Uh, and this is, it's not just us in America, uh, Fran. When I was in Eastern Europe, it was really astonishing to me to talk to young people uh, in the post-communist generation, the first post-communist generation, and discover how little they knew about what their own parents and grandparents had gone through and how strangely their parents didn't want to burden them with the knowledge of how hard things have been under communism because they, they wanted their kids to have a fresh start. Mm -hmm. you know? But what's happening is these young people with no real knowledge of this they don't know what they're defending. And it turns out they just want to be like Sweden. You know, mm -hmm. they want to be uh, consumers, uh, free to make their own choices. In Poland, to my great shock, I found uh, a consensus among young practicing Catholics there that within 10, maybe 20 years, Poland is going to go the same way of Ireland. Yeah. For somebody like me who grew up in the John Paul II years, this is just shocking. But when I talked to older priests, they said, yeah, same thing. It's happening. I want to I want to go back for a moment, Rod, on because I think this is really a central uh, element of of your thinking, not just in this book, but in Benedict Option as well. I mean, uh, history Americans have, as you indicate, have always been really bad at history. I mean, if you look at that famous line from Henry Ford, "History is bunk. We don't need it." And the whole idea of a novus or, ordo seclorum, the, a new order of the ages, instinctively seems to bias Americans against the baggage of the past. I mean, you articulate this very well in, in all of your work, frankly. How do you get people to remember? I mean, I, maybe this speaks to the latter part of your book, but I mean, memory is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. Americans are lousy at it. Catholics in particular in this country, um, in their eagerness to assimilate, 
have jettisoned a lot of their uh, history and memory and, and things that are culturally adhesive for us. I mean, so what do people do? Well, we have to tell stories first and foremost, and not just give them, not just recite facts, but tell stories and to tell why these stories are important. When I was in Prague, I was at the home of Camilla Bendova. She and her uh, late husband, Václav Benda, they were, uh, uh, they were the only Catholics in Václav Havel's inner circle of leading dissidents. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was asking Camilla how she and her late husband prepared their family for resistance. One of the things she said they did was, or she did herself, was to read to these kids for at least two hours a day. They had six kids. She was trying to raise them under communist oppression with her husband in prison for four years. Wow. Uh, but I, I said to her, what did you read? She said, well, I read them the classics. I read the myths and I read a lot of Tolkien. Tolkien, well, why Tolkien? Yeah. I said, yeah. she said, because we knew that Mordor was real. Mm -hmm. And we knew that the story of these characters was our story of resisting evil. Well, I found that really interesting because I expected her to tell me as she had told me earlier, that you know, they talked to them about the communist government and why, why this is evil and so on and so forth. But the second part of that was so crucial of filling those kids' moral imaginations with stories to remind them who they were as Catholics and as Czechs and as bearers of Western civilization. The communists were trying to destroy all of that. Well, guess what? Here we are today in 2021 and uh, a man in uh, a Catholic, teacher of English in Budapest tell, tells me in the book that in his experience, uh, free market capitalism has done more to erase cultural memory in his country than even the communists did. Yeah. Now, Aldous Huxley talks about how, well, I should say Neil Postman, the late media critic, said that Orwell feared a world where they would burn books, but Huxley feared a world in which nobody would have to burn books because nobody cared about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Postman is a wonderful... Uh, guide to thinking about technology for obviously technology but just culture in general and of course he was a secular jew but i mean so much of his work resonates with uh, with faithful christians in terms of how they interpret the culture around them and alistair mcintyre said famously that before we can answer the question what am i to do we have to first ask ourselves of which story or stories am i a part mm -hmm. and that's why maintaining this cultural memory is so important uh, under communism, people would gather in private homes. The Bendas host, hosted this at their apartment. They would gather in these homes for seminars in which they would talk about history. They would talk about art, literature, all these things that they weren't getting in school and, and that they couldn't talk about in the public square because they had to keep that memory alive for their children. Yeah, I, I, I just want to revisit before my last question. I want to revisit very quickly Tolkien. You, that you really... You really hit a nerve with me when you said that because I think I think he is an extraordinary number one. He's an extraordinary storyteller, but the two things that seem to me to to be the the biggest antidotes, and you touch on this in various writings, to where we're heading is is this idea of storytelling, good storytelling, and then personal witness, obviously, which you also emphasize through I mean throughout all of your work, personal witness and storytelling, and understanding that we belong to those stories. <clears throat> resonate with them is a really powerful antidote to the negatives that are in the culture right now. My last question, uh, Rod, is you have a job where you uh, could easily be enraged every minute of every day, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and anger is toxic. I know it because I deal with it myself and have for most of my career because, you know, I've, I've, I, I haven't worked in the same way that you have, but I mean, in, in my own line, uh, there's plenty to be upset about. Uh, the, the, how do you deal with that? I mean, how do you how do you maintain a kind of an inner peace? And most of all, what gives you hope and joy in a circumstance that appears sometimes to be so dark? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, first of all, there's a difference between optimism and hope. I'm not an optimist. An optimist is somebody who expects everything it was always going to work out. It's going to get better and better. I don't think that realism allows us that at this time in this place. But I am hopeful. For a Christian, hope tells us that no matter how bad things get, if we unite our suffering to Christ, we can know that the Lord will use it for the good, ultimately. So the martyrs were men and women of hope. And I think we have to use that as an example. 
going in my case, going over to Soviet Union, former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and meeting people, some of whom went to prison or saw their spouses go to prison for their faith. It really just filled me with so much hope because these people knew what it was like to suffer mm -hmm. and look at them. It was their faith that got them through that. And it just inspired me to not just read about it on the page, but to meet them face to face and sit down and have dinner with them. It's just incredible. But I, I think it is true that the world, as Russell Kirk said, the world is sunlit despite its vices. In my case, uh, what keeps me going is friendship, is the amazing friendships I've managed to make doing this kind of work, especially with Christians. I've become dear friends with Marcus Sermarini. He's a figure that he plays, plays big in my book, The Benedict Option. He is a Catholic lawyer in Italy, a little town called San Benedetto del Tronto. And he and his friends founded an organization or a fellowship called the Tipiloski, which means the usual suspects. And they live, <laughs> they live their Great time. Time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They, they live their Catholic faith out with such joy uh, there in the community there in, in their seaside village. And just meeting people like that who, who are just such inspiration. My work has been a blessing to me because I, I've been able to travel and get to know them. I also, um, also have to say that the pleasure of intellectual and artistic discovery has been a great blessing to me. Yeah. Right now, I'm finally reading um, uh, Kristen Labrin's Daughter. Oh, which, yeah. Yeah, I, I've never Rod, read it. This my, it's my wife's favorite book of all time. She's read it four times. It's a fabulous book. It's a great book. And I had never read it. My wife has been on me for years to read it. After 20 years, I finally picked it up and I'm really into it. And to me, it's little things like that, Fran. And, and most famously, I guess, in my case, discovering in the middle of the journey of my life, the Divine Comedy of Dante Alighieri. <laughs> Wonderful. The Lord used Dante to bring me to deep repentance. And um, I, it just it gives me so much pleasure because you just don't know what's around the corner and who you're going to meet, what stories you're going to hear next. It gives you a completely different outlook on life. But I want to say this too, knowing that I'm on the Napa Institute um, uh, podcast, that I allowed at one point in my life anger to overtake me. I, as you know, we've known each other for a long time. I used to be a Catholic and I was a very fervent Catholic. Uh, always ready to fight the culture war in my, my writings in the newspaper and so on. I began to write about the abuse scandal in summer of 2001, even before it broke big out of Boston. Father Tom Doyle, who has been an ad advocate for victims, told me, he said, listen, if you keep going down this path of investigation, you're going to go to places darker than you can imagine. And I said, but Father, I feel like I have to do it as a Catholic, as a journalist, and as a new father. He said, well, I'll help you any way I can, but just know that it's going to be rough. Well, nothing prepared me for what I was going to see, Fran. And I was so outraged by one thing after the other that I, I let my passions guide me because I thought that just preparing myself intellectually and having all the arguments for Catholicism in my head would be sufficient protection. Turns out it wasn't. Um, and I eventually lost my capacity to believe as a Catholic even though as I was about a year before I lost my Catholic faith, uh, a friend of mine said, listen, man, I agree with you. This is outrageous, the scandal, but your anger is going to break you if you let it. And yeah. I, I, I couldn't even understand that. I thought that if I, were, if I wasn't enraged at all times, I was somehow breaking faith with the victims. Well, later on, after I lost my ability to believe as a Catholic, you know, the Lord gave me a second chance in orthodoxy, but I also had to repent of the arrogance that I had intellectually and the spiritual pride that led me to set myself up for that, that fall. And I remember, Fran, going back to 1992 when I first got interested in becoming Catholic. I was working at a newspaper in Baton Rouge and uh, one of my colleagues there, a photographer said, oh, I hear you're interested in the Catholic church. I'm a Catholic, why don't you come work with me at Mother Teresa's uh, soup kitchen, the Missionaries of Charity soup mm -hmm. kitchen this weekend. And I thought, well, that's a very Catholic thing. I think I'll do it. So I went there, peeled potatoes, peeled carrots, washed dishes, and it was over. I thought, that's it? I don't know what I was looking for, maybe a mystical experience. I never went back to the soup kitchen because I thought I'm more of an intellectual. My time would be better spent reading books of theology and apologetics. Well, in the ruins of my Catholic faith, 13, 14 years later, I thought back, to that moment and wished that I had gone back to the soup kitchen. 
because there's something about getting out of your head and making your faith oh, yeah. real with your hands, right? With your that, hands. Yeah. Yes. And that would have prepared me spiritually for the work that I believe God was asking me to do in writing about the scandal. So what I would say, I say this to all Christians now, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, do not think that your intellect, your intellectual conviction will be enough to protect you from the power of your passions, even passions like mine, which were geared towards justice. Um, it, it unhorsed me. And I have, I've tried to be very, very careful in the years since then to guard the gift of faith the Lord has given me and to be grateful for his second chances, but um, also to try to figure out a way to do my work in, in keeping that balance. Because as you say, Fran, there's so many things in the world you can get infuriated about. And if you don't have that balance in your life, then uh, you, you can become a monster yourself. Oh, yeah. If you look at the history of the church, Rod, as you, as you do, there's, <laughs> there's more than enough material there to be enraged all the time. But that's the story of the world, and it's the story of the human heart. Um, and you've been very articulate today in, in helping us understand the books that you've done, the work that you do, and, and your experience as a journalist. Um, the name of the, of, the, of the current book is Live Not By Lies, and it's published by Sentinel, which is an imprint of Random House. Uh, where can people get it? They could get it on Amazon or from the usual sources, but I like to send people to a little Christian bookstore in Wichita called Eighth Day Books. They have a website, uh, Eighth Day, Day Books. Books, right? And they're the exclusive sellers of signed copies of my book, but uh, which is a bonus you get from Order to Eighth Day, but it's also an opportunity to support a small Christian bookstore and one that is doing fantastic work to build up Perfect. local Christian community in Wichita among Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants who know that we need each other in the worst way in this time. And I can end, friend, by saying that that is one of the things that really impressed me about talking to all these people in the Eastern Bloc, no matter what their confession was, they all told me that when they went to prison, it didn't matter whether you were Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant. The reason the secret police came for you was because you are a worshiper of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And they all discovered in prison a deeper brotherhood across ecclesial lines. And they didn't surrender their ecclesial things that made them distinct. I mean, these things are important. But in the future that we are all in this culture rushing towards, the Christians uh, who are faithful to any kind of orthodox traditional view of Christianity, we're going to need each other in the worst way and in very practical ways, as I outline in my book. Well, thank you so much for your time, Rod. Really, uh, it, it's a pleasure talking to you. And, and your books are, they're wonderful for their content. They're wonderful for their style. I mean, people understand your work very clearly because of the, the transparency of what you say. So congratulations on another really good piece of work. Well, you're very kind to say that. And I'll see you in the trenches, my brother. Okay, God bless. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.